Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Freedom Online Coalition Open Forum in this very intimate space designed for interaction and, and conversation. So we'll have to do our best uh, to, to get a proper dialogue going. I'd also like to welcome those of you who've flown around the world at great disruption to the environment to sit and do your emails and Facebook page. It's good to see you found a quiet space to do that, but maybe it might be nice to actually join in the conversation as well. So please feel free to do that once we've introduced the speakers and got the conversation going. The Freedom Online Coalition is a coalition of 30 countries that was established originally in 2011 to promote internet freedom and human rights online. It's a very active coalition currently under the chairmanship of the German federal government. And on the panel this morning, I'm very pleased to welcome, as the head of the Cyber Coordination Unit at the German Federal Foreign Office, uh, Wolfram von Heinitz, his colleague Lisa Vermeer is a senior policy advisor at the Dutch MFA, uh, Ms. Wafa ben Hassin, the MENA Policy Council for Access Now at the end, and next to her, Matthew Shears, who's one of the co-chairs of the Freedom Online Advisory Network, which is a network of civil society and independent observers who work with the coalition on policy development. I'm going to start by asking Wolfram just to set out the current work of the FOC and the current priorities of the German government, and maybe a mention a little bit about the Berlin Conference that's coming up that they're organizing. And then I'm going to move on to the other panelists to talk about one of the big issues confronting the coalition which is really the shrinking of civic space and the shrinking of the ability of independent civil society organizations to impact upon their societies in general, including areas of internet policy. And the changes we've seen since 2011, and I think the shift from a mood of somewhat optimism, the belief that the internet could open up society, open up dialogue, open up conversation, to a slightly more dystopian view where the internet is seen increasingly as a fraught and troubled place full of harms, often ill-defined, and where authoritarian governments are developing really significant capacities to actually curtail speech and introduce surveillance on a, on a tremendous scale using the very technologies which originally were thought to be liberating and democratizing. So there's some very big challenges here. I hope you have the chance to address that. I'm going to ask the panel to say a few introductory remarks, but I am very keen to try and get contributions from the audience. There are a number of governments present number of civil society activists, many of whom I recognize, so I hope we can have a proper conversation. Wolfram, can I start with you, though, and ask you just to set out the initial, the current state of play with the FOC and the German government leadership? Yes, happy to do so. First of all, also a warm welcome for me. Thank you very much for this nice and kind introduction. Yes, the FOC, as you said, it is 30 countries gathered around the idea that uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms must be protected offline and online in the same way. So how do we try to achieve that? Well, there are several elements. One element is the yearly conference. I will talk about that a little bit later. And then there are statements on certain issues which are agreed upon the 30 countries and then adopted and published. But the value of both the conferences to have an, uh, a discussion on matters that matter and of the statement is not the statement in itself or just having a conference for the sake of the conference. The purpose is that it then is implemented into real areas where it has effect. And for that reason, one important element is the, uh, are the local networks because the work that is relevant is done also, not, not only, but very, to a very large extent inside the UN in New York and in Geneva and also, of course, here in Paris at the UNESCO. So the local networks are basically the representatives of the member states of the coalition in these three cities, New York, Geneva, and Paris. And then the idea is that the coalition basically uh, implement the thinking and the, the results of the deliberations of the statements, the agreed positions into the work in the UNESCO and in the UN system. But also, of course, in bilateral talks and also in engagement with civil society. And particularly for the last reason, that's one of the great achievements, this basically state-centered organization of Freedom Online Coalition now has an advisory network with representatives of the civil society. And I think Matthew will talk a little bit more in detail about that. That's it. Mm. So we think that is important because 
we have the, we have a, a double threat, I would say. We have a threat to multilateralism, so we need to see how do we achieve a multilateral system that is more effective and like gathering like-minded countries around certain topics, having discussions, trying to formulate opinions on that, getting expert input, interaction with the civil society into their work, and then bring this into the wider multilateral and particularly UN system is, I think, a good answer to these threats to multilateralism. Then, of course, we also have threats to freedoms, of course. We have hate speed, we have censorships. We have to watch that good intentions don't lead to bad results. And that's why some of the um, statements of the Freedom Online Coalition centered on particularly that. We had a censorship statement that was adopted and published at the RightCons conference in, I think it was May, in Toronto. We have a statement upcoming at the conference in Germany on digital divide, and we're working on a statement on civic spaces that is very timely to the discussion we're having here, and will also be one of the focuses of the conference in Berlin. Because we have this challenge at the moment to multilateralism, but also to freedoms online, uh, we took as a topic for the conference in Berlin, which will be at the end of November, Internet Freedom at Crossroads, Common Path Towards Strengthening Human Rights Online. And the, as I said before, uh, it will be very much focused on kind of having a discussion on these topics in more detail to find out a common path. Uh, two particular po topics where I want to explain what that means. One topic is freedom of choice. We will have one session at least uh, on this topic, and the idea is to see how, does, how is the freedom of choice limited or endangered in the Internet, and freedom of choice as a broader concept. Freedom of choice, what platforms do you use? Freedom of choice, how do you access the Internet? How is your data used? Are you the owner of your data? Have, do you have a freedom of choice, what happens with your data? Uh, freedom of choice, of course, to express your opinion as you like. Freedom of choice, uh, how you socially engage in what kind of social environment you want to live and particularly also work. So that's one of the overarching themes of the conference and we hope to have, and you see these are controversial issues. We don't have a, one opinion and then everybody agrees to it. It's really getting into the details and trying to find out paths forward. And the other subject, of course, is, well, you could call it shrinking spaces, but you could also narrow it to how to tackle hate speech in the internet and uh, just to, to I mean, I'm really looking forward for this, this discussion also because there we have at least two different concepts which already played a huge role in preparing the conference. We have the, you could say the European or German uh, access, which is not the same, but, but, but the, the Germany has been very much advanced with the Network Enforcement Act where basically the state sets the boundaries of what could be, what is legal and what is illegal in the internet and then obliges the, um, the platforms basically to remove illegal, illegal contact within a certain time frame. And you have the more American approach of basically leaving uh, to deal with contact to the providers, uh, to, to the platforms themselves through basically their terms of, uh, terms of business basically. So these are two different approaches and we're going to have a discussion on what are the advantages and how can we jointly have common paths to these new challenges because we're all still, well, I wouldn't say amateurs, but don't quote me on that, but we're still, I think, trying to find what is the best way uh, not to overreach, not to overact, and not to destroy that, what is actually a good thing that it enlarges freedom, basically. So I hope to see as many people as possible in Berlin, 28th, 29th, and 30th of November. If you haven't registered yet, you can still do that. Online, it's, what is the address? Freedomonline.de, right? Yeah. So that's the web page, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Wolfram. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to come to you next. As perhaps you could explain to people the role of the advisory group, because that's, I think, how civil society can input into the work of the coalition and maybe say a bit about how the advisory group works and whether there are opportunities for, say, people in this room to become engaged or contribute to the thinking in the coalition through the work of the advisory group. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
So I am one of two co-chairs of the advisory network. Um, Catherine Kendrick is the other chair, and unfortunately she's not able to be here. The advisory network was set up in February 2018, so we're almost coming up on our one-year anniversary. It's, um, it is, um, I, sorry, I just need to be very clear that this is a, a non-governmental advisory network, so it has not only civil society, but it has the technical community, has academia, it has the private sector in it. It's a group of approximately 30 persons, um, and they all bring, uh, they are there in their individual capacity, they all bring uh, a range of expertise, um, and so across the board, so it's not just uh, human rights expertise, but it's also policy expertise, technical expertise, business expertise. And this is a, a new approach for the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, previously, the, the approach for engaging with um, non-governmental actors was through the conferences or through a set of working groups that were set up at the time. Um, but it was felt that there was, and those were on an ad hoc basis, but it was felt there was a need for an, a, a group of individuals who could advise the governments on um, different issues on a more permanent basis. Um, the individuals, the 30 persons, have a two-year mandate, so we're almost uh, halfway through that. Um, and um, that mandate will be up in, in 2020. Um, so we have um, the opportunity, and that the, many of those individuals will be, probably will be renewing, but there will probably be opportunities to be considered for the slots that come open at that point in time. Um, to answer your question on how does one engage, Andrew, the other way of engaging, which I think will be interesting, is that we have always... Um, we recommend to the members of the advisory network that they reach out to the organizations they know and work with or associated with and, um, and seek input on the various products and things that we do, and I'll, I'll come to those right now. Um, the important thing for the advisory network is to be able to contribute to the work of the governments, um, and we do that in um, a number of ways. The two most prominent are in response to requests for information from the government on particular issues. So um, there, are, there are a number of statements that the government has issued, the governments have issued or will be issuing. Um, so we as an advisory network have contributed to those. There is a formal process for developing comments and submitting those comments to the governments and for them to be incorporated into the government's statements. Um, and we, are in the pro we have contributed to the, a statement which will be, um, I'm assuming, released soon on the shrinking civic spaces, which Andrew was referring to. Um, we're also contributing at the moment to a, a potential statement on the digital divide. Um, and that's, so that's in response to government requests. And we can also, as the advisory network, initiate uh, actions from the government, in particular with regards to statements or comments from governments. And um, we have done that um, in the context of engaging at the ITU most recently. This is, um, this is a new construct, um, and um, so we're still finding our way. Um, but I think so far we've, we've proven to be um, uh, valuable to the governments in providing a range of expertise and views on a number of challenging issues. And, um, and that's um, working out quite nicely in terms of the balance between what the advisory network brings and what the governments bring. And I think what you find from that is um, statements that show and reflect um, more of a multi-stakeholder input than you might find otherwise. Um, I think I'll stop there. If there are any questions on the advisory network, of course, happy to, to take them. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Wafa, can I come to you next? You're the policy council for the Middle East, or well, the Arab region, for Access Now, human rights organization, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. You're facing a fairly challenging environment, I think it's fair to say, in the region in which you work. Can you just give us a sense of the changes, how that environment's changing at the moment in relation to internet policy, and whether you think there's a role for something like the Freedom Online Coalition to try and support the kind of work that your organization's doing in that region? Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, absolutely. So uh, we're noticing in the Middle East and North African region, as with a few other countries in the world as well, uh, a trend of closing the civic space online. Uh, what that means is passing types of legislation that either facilitate mass surveillance or crack down on protected speech, such as uh, journalists or any type of speech that should be protected. Um, and we see this particularly in, in for example, Egypt, which is uh, the most populated Arab country, but also setting the standard for the rest of the region. Uh, most recently, 
there was a cybercrime law that was passed, as well as a media regulation law. And um, the cybercrime law, for example, authorizes mass surveillance um, and uh, forces internet service providers to keep and store users' data for 180 days, including access to phone calls, text messages, websites visited, applications used on devices, etc. Uh, and obviously various law enforcement authorities would have access to this type of data at, at will uh, at any time. And so there's also the media regulation law, which um, this, I mean, the point that everybody laughs about, but it defines anyone with a following of over 5,000 people on any type of social media network as a journalist and uh, thus subject to regulations that typically only apply to uh, qualified journalists, not saying they're good either, but uh, it places them under, under strict regulation and supervision, makes them subject to censorship, uh, under vague premises such as uh, publishing false news. Uh, and so it's these kinds of laws that we're really seeing that are just overbroad, disproportionate. Uh, their attempts to fully control all sorts of speech online. Uh, we know in this room that human rights offline apply just as much as they do offline than they, as they do online. And, um, and what we're noticing, I think, not just in the Arab world, but also in the world generally, is that we're seeing this division between countries that want to protect human rights generally, or at least are showing an interest in engaging with civil society, with the technical community, with companies, to protect human rights online, and countries that simply have no interest. Um, with the cyber, uh, sorry, with the call, the Paris call for trust and peace in the cyberspace, we saw that some of the most notorious countries uh, for cracking down on human rights, such as Russia and China, did not sign the call. And the call is obviously not perfect. There's uh, lots to be improved in there, but it does show a serious commitment and engagement to address the issues and uh, explicitly put an eye towards human rights. Uh, ways that the FOC or the Freedom Online Coalition can uh, facilitate this process and stop the trend of, of uh, violating human rights online is, I mean, I think we've, the advisory network already is, is helping a lot and the Freedom Online Coalition has been doing a lot to begin with. But I also think that we need to keep an, op an open mind towards engaging with states that are not members of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, I think that we need to be making a more active effort uh, to, especially in spaces uh, or in events that require lobbying, negotiating, uh, voting, convincing, etc. And that leads me to my second point. Uh, I believe that greater uh, engagement and coordination within the coalition and the advisory network would be helpful in these events as well. And so one of the first things that the FOC did was a statement uh, for the ITU to, uh, to say that involving civil society in the ITU space is crucial to having open conversations. And um, as a member of the advisory network, I fully support and endorse that message. And I think that more can be done in terms of practically engaging together on the ground, uh, working together to see what other states we can uh, kind of convince to be on the side of human rights uh, in the cyberspace. So. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Wafra. And we have copies of the ITU statement and a background note on the coalition down here at the front if anybody wants to collect it at the end so you can see where we've got to. Um, Lisa, can I come to you? Uh, the Dutch were the founders of the Freedom Online Coalition back in 2011, so you've seen a fair few changes. So I guess one of my questions to you is that the FOC is growing, but perhaps the world is becoming more challenging. There's a Harold Pinter play where he says the world is hell but life is beautiful, which sometimes expresses the, the contrast that we live in. And I wondered whether you're seeing trends that worry you now that compared to 2011 and how you think the coalition can most effectively engage in challenging those trends. Thank you, Andrew. And good to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa from the Netherlands. Um, we're still a bit, we're a very proud member at this moment of the... Oh, well, does it work? Closer you have to be closer. Thanks. Um, we are indeed, indeed founders of, uh, of the Freedom Online Coalition and very proud member at the moment of this um, thriving coalition, I would say, especially if you look at uh, the challenges that are there in a multilateral set uh, setting at the moment. Um, to to pinpoint the, the trends, one of the trends is that the the challenges towards civic space online and towards freedom online are so 
wide ranging, which was illustrated by WAFA. If you, t various types of regulation uh, developments, uh, there, there's just this immense um, amount of developments that have a very particular um, uh, character. So it makes it more challenging to respond to the trends and to identify what you, what you want to focus on. And this is also the challenge for the FOC, I think. And I look very much forward towards the, the conference in Germany to sit together with other stakeholders to define where we could really, as the FOC, with the, of course, limited capacity that we have. We are a bunch of governments, but still people that work on Freedom Online with limited capacity to really make a difference and have an impact. Um, you can't address, we can't address like both disinformation, cybercrime, cybersecurity, um, but also uh, counterterrorism challenges, challenges towards financing uh, human rights defenders online, the threat of um, cyber savvy authoritarian governments that they use to intimidate and limit free speech of, um, of human rights defenders. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, and, the, and the challenge is now, or the thing we have to do as the FOC is focus and, um, and, and focus our, our resources on what we can really change. I think we made, made already some, some good steps this year and it's really, we moved this year from a more inward looking um, time during the strategic review up to the conference in San Jose in 2016 towards really a coalition with outgoing initiatives again. We have the advisory network. I'm really proud of the, the, the systematic that we designed together and the, the, the structures that we have at the moment. Um, the advisory network proved to be very effective both in reflecting on the statements that we came up with and um, the proactive advice for the ITU. So uh, this, this gives a, a positive feeling um, that we need to be able to counter all the, um, all the threats that we see. Uh, can I just add yep. a little bit more? Okay. Um, there are two in the sense of outside the topics that we have to address, and I think that we will cover them in Germany. There are two, two aspects that I would like to address um, particularly. The first is that, uh, in our opinion, the FOC is perfectly situated to really help, her, help making the voice of civil society and other actors heard, because civil society struggles to be a real part of the multilateral negotiations all over the world, but also in multi-stakeholder settings like this one. It's, it's quite challenging to be able as civil society groups because of funding and, and enough donors and others to come to meetings and to have a valuable uh, a, um, a contribution to the meetings. And this is something that particularly the FOC governments um, are very well positioned to play a role and to fight for this, for this important voice to, to make heard and also act ourselves by, for example, adding civil society groups to our delegations to the ITU, which was one of the examples that particularly the UK did a very, very good job in taking a lot of civil society organizations to Dubai. So this is one, one, one uh, factor that we should focus on. And the other one is, um, and I can only uh, echo your words, is diplomatic coordination in Geneva, New York, Paris, um, these networks are very, very important and to be able to work together and coordinate our position is uh, increasingly important just because the coordination of authoritarian states is also increasingly better and increasingly effective. So this is some, one of the other um, aspects that the FSC could really have an impact on the ground in a multilateral setting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa. I want to open it up now. Just to, to recap, I think what we've seen is that the coalition is, is, has had a history of developing policy and systematic policy that addresses a number of problems around internet freedom and human rights online. But the democratic countries who are members are also wrestling themselves with some policy uncertainties around how we deal with harms. And how we deal with harms online is a complex issue that can often challenge and threaten how we also deal with internet freedom and human rights. So I think from the coalition's point of view, it's very important to have this more public engagement. It's one of the few intergovernmental networks that I can think of that positively wants to embrace a broader policy community and involve them in the discussions about how government policy should be set and promoted. 
and not just involved in the policy development, but also in the promotion of those policies in the wider diplomatic community. So I think, as Lisa said, one of the things the coalitions try to do is ensure strong civil society participation in forums like the ITU, which are traditionally relatively closed to civil society participation. And as many of you will know, it's very increasingly difficult, in my experience, to get governments around the world to seriously engage with civil society in a meaningful, open, participatory dialogue. So it's very important that one of the few avenues we've got is used to our best ability to strengthen that policy dialogue between the different communities online. So there's some initial thoughts there. I think a lot more could be done. Could we do more in active diplomacy? Could we work more actively with the internet policy community represented at places like the IGF? There's a number of questions that could arise, but be very interested now in your, either in your questions to the panel or in your contributions and thoughts about how the coalition could develop. So if you just give me a quick wave, we'll try and... I'll start with Nicole. Maybe introduce yourself when you speak. Hi, uh, hi, Nicole Gregory from uh, the UK government. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to echo a lot of what Lisa was just saying around how uh, proud we are to be part of the uh, coalition. And, uh, and I think um, that, uh, as Andrew was just saying, from a number of perspectives, both from uh, our domestic agenda, we in the UK are looking at uh, the uh, UK um, outlook on uh, online harms, for want of a better word, in terms of how the UK needs to respond um, domestically and how we want to engage internationally to some of the, uh, the harms that we are seeing online that we are being called as part of our society's calling government to look at and address. But we want to do it in a way that uh, respects uh, our commitments to rights to keep the debate open and, as you say, to include uh, lots of um, parts of civil society and others and how we actually respond to this. So um, part of being a member of the coalition is also actually how we can use this and use the advisory network to reflect likewise on what we are doing domestically and then how we can take that to the international community. And I think that's really important for us. Um, I think also just to kind of flag that, um, uh, that, as you say, with the ITU, we did take a really strong delegation and it was uh, really useful that the advisory network suggested that we did the statement. Um, and again, a really useful example of something that we didn't think about but when you proposed it, we were like, really good idea, because actually we do this, but we don't talk about it enough and we don't put enough out there to say to others, you should be doing the same. So again, likewise, uh, any opportunities that we can do more of that, we're really open to and welcome from the advisory committee and from others. Uh, finally, just to say uh, as well that I think um, uh, from uh, the UK perspective as well, this is also about how we not just make sure that the multi-stakeholder environment is about bringing people into the same room, but about doing joint things together. Um, and I think the more examples that we can do and the more that we can lead on, the more that we can show how this can work in a truly practical way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a brief comment. Um, I uh, also... Just say who you are so that we know just... Yes, I was about to introduce myself. I am a diplomat at the permanent mission of Costa Rica in Geneva, and I am part of the coalition. And I just wanted to echo what Lisa and my colleague from the UK just said, because I do believe that the coalition is a very good and effective platform uh, for a wider uh, community to express their points of view, but actually arrive to commonalities that were, were for instance, you know, uh, portrayed in the joint statement that we presented at the PP18 in, in Dubai. And it's very interesting because as a diplomat and, you know, very used to negotiating tests, uh, I found this as an opportunity in which we were able to express our national uh, positions, interests, but in a much more flexible and understanding uh, manner. And I think this is one of the values of this uh, platform. And I also look forward to uh, the conference in Berlin because after uh, the review that was uh, made in San Jose, Costa Rica in 2016, I think we've come a, a, a long way, even in two years, because of the rapid uh, development of technology and uh, you know, how the geopolitical uh, and multilateral um, you know, ecosystem is, is behaving lately. And I uh, also want to finally uh, express uh, the support of my own country and our respect for human rights uh, so that we can also uh, better influence uh, the, the potential outcomes for the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to thank Costa Rica. They were a very effective chair of the coalition a couple of years ago. We had a, we had a great time down in San Jose at the conference there. Uh, are there any other, any other, other questions or points? This is the opportunity of people who are not in governments to put points, ideas, thoughts directly to government representatives themselves. So 
This is an opportunity you don't get very often, uh, so do take advantage of it. Otherwise, I'll ask the questions. Yeah. Thanks very much. My name is Luc Tokendorf. I'm from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Luxembourg, so another diplomat. And I was hesitant to speak because, like you said, this should be a space for civil society to, uh, to speak. Um, we are not members of the Freedom Online Coalition, uh, at least not yet. I hope that we may join uh, soon. Um, but we share the uh, values and ideas of the members of the coalition on uh, the uh, internet. Um, there's a number of things that I think are, are really important to work on together, uh, both uh, between states but also civil societies and the technology sector. Um, and um, I think one of, the, one of them is one that uh, everybody on the panel mentioned, and that's this dangerous dichotomy uh, that we have between freedom and human rights on the one hand and security on the other hand. And that is not only a problem of authoritarian states, it is also one of democratic states uh, because we have a lot of security overreach. Um, another one is not only the question of civic society and civil society space shrinking, but also the capture of civil society space uh, by authoritarian actors. Um, and I've been, uh, I go to a number of multilateral fora. Uh, one of them is the OSCE's uh, Human Dimension Implementation Meeting, and that is progressively being taken over uh, by so-called uh, quasi or governmental NGOs. Uh, and they are speaking as civil society, uh, but they are financed entirely by authoritarian states. Um, I wonder, is this also a danger in the online space? Do you see this tendency as well? Uh, and how do we break it? I mean, one way to break it would be to counter uh, this toxic moral relativism that places everyone who is non-governmental on the same level. Thank you. Wafa, can I come to you on that point? Because I remember the very first uh, Tunis conference that established the IGF, and it was packed full of Tunisian so-called NGOs who are actually all funded, government-funded agents. So that was my first experience of seeing a so-called civil society event flooded with people who had nothing to do with civil society. Are you seeing that kind of trend in, in the Arab world of increasing numbers of fake, essentially fake NGOs? That was one of the first things I noticed when I went to my first Human Rights Council meeting, uh, the HRC in Geneva. Uh, I didn't know that about Tunis. Uh, I think we, re we have many more NGOs, I think, than other countries that are not fronts for authoritarian governments. But uh, when I, uh, I, it is absolutely a problem. Uh, I, 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 I realized that I was one of the few who, I was a member of civil society actually speaking out against uh, human rights abuses. Uh, and uh, when I went there, I found that almost all of the nonprofits from the Arab world at the HRC present were, were fronts. Um, and this is absolutely a problem. Uh, you can't, I mean, it's difficult. It's a very sensitive topic, right? Because you can't just discount uh, civil society or nonprofits. But um, I remember seeing at, at a table uh, at the HRC so many posters that are just propaganda from different states in the region, not even inviting folks to a side event or anything like that. It was just pure propaganda. So. Um, and obviously this doesn't mean that we should restrict civil society that comes to the HRC or anything like that. That's the, absolutely the opposite of what I'm calling for. It's just that um, we're adapting and governments are too. And it'll be a game of cat and mouse or chess uh, for a while. But I think that it's on us as well, civil society, to do more capacity training, to do more uh, risk assessments, digital security trainings, et cetera, to help get that legitimate uh, civil society's voice in those spaces. And it's difficult because it's not just the activists or human rights defenders' uh, digital security that we're worried about. We're also worried about their physical security. So what ends up happening is a lot of times we see advocates go to various gatherings and then when they come back home to their home states they are arrested or imprisoned or detained or bothered or harassed or and that's absolutely not what we want to see happen and so this goes back to my original point of uh, engaging with non-FOC member states because um, it's it's crucial I think to achieve the goals that the FOC would like to see happen in protecting the online civic space and protecting civic space generally even offline as well. So um, the advisory network is a good example of having civil society and governments work together to achieve that. And I think we need to see more of these kinds of initiatives as well. Thank you. Is there a lady at the back? 
Thank you, Christine Merkel, German Commission for UNESCO. Thank you for the very rich and um, substantial inputs. Exactly on the last element, I wonder, it's very impressive to see how you have evolved towards a civil society inclusive model. But indeed, our main work is on cultural and media policies. And, and we see, and also the Human Rights Council in Geneva has done monitoring work on that. And the shrinking space for civic uh, action has also seen important legal changes very recently. It's like two, three years where we see and document that. And I would appreciate if a body like also FOC sees itself also as an actor uh, in that, because uh, we do run into increasing troubles because people tend to, sorry, this micro doesn't work uh, easily. Um, the people tend to take the notion of civil society as a given. And uh, what you mentioned about Tunisia is a result of the 2011 very progressive law, but it didn't exist before, and Egypt went exactly the other way around, so did Russia. So in, in that sense, I would appreciate anybody who is serious about this multi-stakeholder approach also to educate both ourselves and, and to document this underlying uh, fabric, because otherwise we will indeed run into the trouble which was uh, indicated. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely what we want to do. We don't want to undermine any existing frameworks. We want to strengthen it on the contrary. On the particular issue you raised, one of the issues we actively worked on was supporting Ireland in their resolution in the Human Rights Council on society space. So, so, so there's... Uh, so there is a kind of a pathway to go through it, but because the regulations in a body, body like the Human Rights Council and the deliberations are, have to fo follow more formal rules, this kind of informal group of states, what the Freedom Online Coalition is, and that goes also to our Luxembourg colleague, I mean, everybody is welcome, basically. Formal membership is one thing, but in a conference you can always t participate, and the same is true for for civil society, so it's very open on one side, but it's also very closed on the other side, because what we demand from both, from government and also civil organizations, is of course a commitment to human rights and particularly to freedom rights. So if you have that commitment, you're more than welcome and you can discuss with, I try to avoid the word like-minded, A, because it's inflated, and B, it doesn't mean you have to be like-minded on every issue, single issue. It, just means you have to share this basic concern and this basic convince that these human rights as, as established in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are essential and worth protecting. If you share that commitment, then we can discuss about details and to a certain degree, at least from our perspective, this is also very helpful because when we set up the conference in Berlin, as example, we don't have the answers to all the questions. We have questions ourselves and we need the advice. We need the advice from what worked, what didn't work in other countries. So one new element we added to this conference this time for the first time is actually a, a peer exchange of experiences, what worked, what didn't work. So that's a new and very valuable element which we ha will have at day one. But also, of course, from civil society. So, so this helps us to form our own opinion. When we have our opinion, that's not enough, then have a statement, the statement is good. We have to channel that back into the established formats, and that's exactly like we supported the Irish resolution. There's also, I think, a Swedish-sponsored traditional resolution where we had a heavy influence on, where basically the members of the Freedom Online Coalition then could uh, channel in the experience and the good advice they got through the Freedom Online Coalition into the UN system. Yes, thanks. Um, I think it's really important that we consider the notion of uh, civic space as being the respond and identifying cyber harms as being the responsibility of all stakeholders. Um, it, it's, it's a little too easy to point the finger at civil society and say that you're responsible for, for civic space. We have a significant problem in terms of this sh shrinkage. Um, the tools that are at the disposal now of various parties to shrink, deliberately shrink that space are multiplying. 
Um, and I think we need to take a different perspective on it. And this may mean that um, one of the ways to address a couple of points out there, one of the ways of identifying who the, the real players are as opposed to those who aren't, um, is to work in, across stakeholders to actually bu build those relationships with other stakeholders so that the identity of the parties that you're engaging with becomes much clearer. It's very easy for a, a party to identi self-identify civil society in some obscure part of the internet and, and bombard the rest of the internet with disinformation undermining the legitimacy of actual civil society organizations. And therefore, I would encourage us to consider that is a, a joint responsibility, and joint responsibility to work together and that will help in part to, to address some of the identification of some of these players. But at the bigger, the, my bigger point is that I think we have a common responsibility for the civic space and we can't forget that. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I wanted to respond on, on one thing that Wafa brought to, uh, to the discussion and that made me remind that um, the Freedom Online Coalition also took the initiative to, to start the Digital Defenders Partnership. Um, in 2012, this program started and we have eight donors at the moment. The eight FOC countries are, are in the donor community for the Digital Defenders Partnership. And the interesting aspect with this program is that it started as um, a program that focused on digital threats for human rights defenders. And we're mainly the, the human rights defenders working on digital rights, really. The, the, the tech-savvy human rights defenders that un understood the internet and understood the, the possible harm. And this world has changed tremendously up to today because every human rights defender, every civil society organization works online and has to do with digital threats. And also, um, DDP developed, they, they um, beautifully responded to the, to the changing environment. And what I really um, like the most about the DDP approach is that they first focus a lot on the holistic security. So digital is, is one, it's like the, ma the, the starting points, but then they, are, they do not scare away from um, taking all the other threats into account and psychosociological uh, and um, all, the, all the threats are, are in their program. And the other um, aspect is that they focus more and more on having fellows and digital security fellows to work together and to enable themselves to be better to respond quickly to the needs that are there in the human rights defenders community. So I just take the chance on being on this panel to invite also the other member states that are here to join the donor uh, um, the donor community for DDP, and I'm very happy to share our experience on, uh, on, on being part of them and why it's so important to have DDP as one of the flagship projects for, um, for human rights defenders all over the world. Thank you. Thanks. You wanted to come in. Uh, my name is Rashid Mkundu from Zimbabwe, um, a delegate of Freedom House, but I work for international uh, media support. I, I wanted to find out from uh, our panelists uh, your appreciation of the, uh, rather the level of appreciation of uh, uh, online policy issues by our governments that would enable them uh, to engage more effectively uh, with uh, civil society. Um, and uh, to those that are working on the ground, um, is there any success story of finding common ground uh, with our governments on uh, uh, online uh, rights issues? Uh, and if so, what were those issues that uh, the, our governments would appreciate that they need to sit down with civil society and agree uh, on the promotion of, of, of rights? And how did you uh, come to that, uh, to that uh, understanding? Thank you. Do, do you mean when you say governments, that are not members of the coalition? That are not members of the coalition, yes, yes, yes. We're, we're gonna, we've got 15 minutes, so I'm going to take a couple of questions and then come back to the panel. So, uh, Robert, you're next, and then I'm going to come here. Um, so I was going to, Matthew um, actually said a couple of things that I was going to in terms of spaces in the past, in terms of how they were. Um, so it's Robert Guerra from Privaterra, and here working with um, SIPA at, at this meeting. I, I think two things. I think in the aspect of uh, spaces where we're active, whether it's um, um, the Freedom Online Coalition or other spaces, is... Um, you know, in the past, it was really showing up in, um, um, at WISIS, um, and before that, it was really difficult. It was a really threatening space, but I think an approach, as you mentioned, Matthew, I think going forward is not so much, it's more in the work that we do going forward is collaborating um, in a multi-stakeholder fashion where possible. Um, it's challenging at times, 
um, but also recognizing that civil society isn't just NGOs, it's also you know, private sector and, and others as well. And, and, and sometimes associations will try to represent other stakeholders mistakenly as well. And so it doesn't just affect us. Um, and I think um, we should be aware of that as well, um, particularly for industry groups as well. And pointing out that that's a, you know, some of the approaches that civil society have taken to try to spot you know, the fake groups from the other could be particularly helpful. Um, and that's a way to bring allies as well. So I just wanted to make a comment on that. Um, in terms of the work of the Freedom Online Coalition, I think going forward, um, it's great that the meeting's taking place in, in Germany, um, um, and I commend them for that. It's a lot of hard work, but there's, um, there's time. Um, but I think another aspect, too, is that for, um, uh, for a lot of the um, internet issues, it's not just um, here, it's also taking place at ICANN and other spaces. And the question is, um, it may have been discussed earlier, to what extent is the coalition connecting with other groups that are also working on other um, international issues where there is an internet component? Um, for example, access to medicines or um, access to knowledge that also have their communities. There are some issues of, of overlap that we're seeing, for example, the use of human right impacts assessments at ICANN and how that's a tool um, and other aspects. So I'm just wondering, um, to what extent kind of that collaboration with other communities is taking place or being planned. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Gabriel Carson. I'm from Tanzania, part of the Youth IGF. I'd like to share the, maybe my experience and uh, get comments from the panelists. So the, the situation that's happening right now in Tanzania and uh, most of the neighboring states is that we see a lot of crackdown on free speech. That they, they have passed uh, a media act where journalists are supposed to be registered and get their content uh, regulated uh, sort of before publishing. And also open forums are uh, required to submit their users so there's a direct uh, conflict in terms of uh, an ino uh, the privacy or an in anonymity of the people. Also the situation is uh, we see you're not allowed to criticize online. Uh, even though it might be right. Uh, so as we young people, most of the time we use social media in a coming of age in a social media age. Right now we are in fear. How far can we say what's right or what's not? Because just sending a message on WhatsApp, you might get jailed. And most, the, most of the journalists that are uh, publishing online have been kidnapped, it's a real thing, and have been killed. And it's, it's happening. And uh, when the NGOs try to petition the government, there's a barrier of entry to the judiciary system until now there is no resolution that has been brought there. And also we see a lot of censorship that happens through licensing of bloggers and the same thing happening in Uganda where you need to pay a tax for social media that, you know, censorship happens in a lot of ways. So I would like to listen to your comments on the situation that happens and maybe what you can do to help. Thanks very much. And woman at the back. Is the mic working? Yes, okay, very good. Um, my name's Marie, I'm from the Digital Defenders Partnership, so I'd like to first thank Lisa for your great introduction. Um, of course, as mentioned during the entire panel, there's of course the advisory committee, but the Digital Defenders Partnership was also created by the FOC, so I invite anyone who's interested in the program to come meet with myself and my colleague Angela during the conference. We also have two of our fellows, so Lisa spoke about a fellowship program that we've developed. So that could also be interesting, I think, for a lot of the actors in civil society that are attending. So I didn't have so much of a question, but I just wanted to indicate that we're here. We're very happy to meet with interested individuals and share information on our work and just reaffirm that most of what's been discussed on the panel we also see very clearly. So the fact that there's a shrinking civic space, we've really seen an increase in the amount of demands for support. So not only from very tech savvy actors in civil society, but from general CSOs that would not have perhaps been uh, aware or cognizant of these threats in the years past. And the threats aren't simply from authoritarian regimes. It also comes from, for example, more and more often even private sector companies that are using the internet in ways to threaten these organizations. So we will also be present at the FOC conference in uh, Berlin. So we look forward to meeting with you and hope to be able to provide support uh, in this capacity uh, to civil society organizations. So thank you. Thanks very much. Is there any final questions before we, because there's a number there I'm going to try and wrap up in one package and go around the panel, but quick chance. 
Hi, uh, my name is Robert, I'm from the Netherlands, and I am wondering if FOC members are in any way also pressuring their own governments to not work together with authori authoritarian states in terms of selling uh, techniques on surveillance, cybersecurity, etc., because there was a lot of talk on working together with uh, civil society in other countries, but I'm really wondering to what extent they are working together with their own government and pressuring their own government to limit or even cancel this cooperation altogether. Thank you. Thanks. So I think we've got a range of questions. I'm going to, and I think you'll answer from different perspectives depending on whether you're the government or civil society. So one, one question is about engagement with non-member states around issues that threaten online freedoms. We've had a question both from Zimbabwe and Tanzania in that respect. And what can be done can, other than promoting good policies or just condemning governments, is there more active engagement that you see yourself as governments undertaking to try and tackle some of those issues? Secondly, uh, to what extent is the wider political engagement going beyond some of the traditional internet forums into other areas that Robert flagged up, like access to medicines or access to knowledge? I'm not aware of activities in that field, but is that something that the governments feel you could engage in? Um, thirdly, what about the role of the private sector? Does the FOC look at the role of the private sector and the way that the private sector can impinge on fundamental rights and freedoms? And if, if so, in what way? And uh, maybe start with those questions. And I'll start, I should start with Wafer and, and um, Matthew. Give your reflections first, and I'll come to Lisa and Wolfram. Um, I, I really don't have that much to say at this point, but I did want to kind of mention that, at least from our perspective as a member of civil society, um, at Access Now, as well as some of the other organizations that are represented in the advisory network, such as uh, APC, Article 19, um, all of these organizations do work with local partners in various countries. So what we try to do is identify the most appropriate party from civil society to advocate against these kinds of laws and advocate for better policies. And so um, that's one of our guiding strategies right now, but I think obviously a lot more can be done. and. As Matthew mentioned, um, it's, it's not just on civil society to protect the civic space. So usually we're, we're not, I mean, we're well-funded sometimes, but lots of civil society are not well-funded at all. And so um, there isn't an endless capacity to address all of the digital policies, especially given the diversity and, and um, variance in these issues as, as the cyber, uh, cyber issues take up more and more of our everyday lives. But... Um, again, throughout cooperation with, with, and again, not like-minded governments, but governments that do prioritize human rights and, and these kinds of uh, uh, issues, this is, this is the way forward, I think. But I would be happy to speak afterwards as well to hear more from you and if you have any other ideas as to how we could be better. Thanks, Matthew? Yes, great questions. Um, there are, um, I think it's fair to say that, um, to address the first point, I think it's fair to say that there are examples, good examples of um, different stakeholders engaging with governments on a range of issues, including in more difficult policy areas such as cybersecurity. And I, I'm happy to chat with you afterwards about what they are, and, and I think that's, um, th and there are things that can be built on there, and there are learnings from those types of engagement as well. So I think that's, that's it exists, it, it's not huge, but it exists. Um, I think the question about working with other groups is, is incredibly important. Um, most of the individuals on the advisory network have links into other organizations and structures and processes. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon, <laughs> and gov yes, and governments. Um, and I think it's important for us as the advisory network as we, as we move forward to reach out more. And I think it's a, a, a good reminder, thank you, for, for us to do that. Um, um, the, on international pressures to bring about change, a third question, um, when, hopefully when you'll see the shrinking spaces statement, I think a number of the issues that you re referred to or hinted at um, are addressed in there, including the use of, by governments of particular types of technologies, the use of governments putting in place disproportionate policies that can infringe on human rights and, and other things. So I, I, hopefully that will address, and I think the, and that's where then, based on that, international pressures could be brought and possibly other, other mechanisms. Um, on the FOC pressuring its own governments, well, <laughs> I think I have to leave that to the governments, but, but I think, you know, that's, that's, 
let's be frank for a moment. You know, we, we, we are an advisory network working with governments who haven't, have a range of views on different issues with which we may not always agree. And this has always been the case with the advisory networks in, uh, with non-governmental participation in the work of the FOC. But that's a healthy thing. So, you know, we, we, in, we enjoy that to and fro between the governments and the advisory network, and we think that's an important part of what we do. Um, but specifically on that, I'll, I'll leave it to Lisa. Lisa, over to you. Um, yeah, I would like to first address the, the questions on, on, on uh, violations in specific countries. Um, the, the FOC focuses on addressing trends in the first place. So what we what we think is is important that if you have 30 countries that that create this joint statement, that it has it can impact the multilateral negotiations about norms and trends that are developing in the UN, the Human Rights Council, Third Committee, etc. Um, and with with specific specific violations such as in Tanzania no, now. Um, what we do is the FOC, the FOC countries that, that are all in the capital, they all reach out to their embassies, especially the, the friends of the chair. We often discuss these instances and these violations and then reach out to our missions and ask them to at least um, um, identify possibilities to engage and to work together with the other FOC missions that are there. Um, I can give you an example about one about an aspect that, that challenges this, this procedure. For example, with the internet shutdown in Cameroon, um, I had lots of discussions with our colleagues working on Cameroon, but we don't have a mission. So it, it limits, it also limits your possibility to act. So um, this is definitely on our minds and we monitor as an FOC community, we monitor what's happening all over the world and, and talk with our colleagues on the ground. What you also can do from another, from, from the civil society perspective in broad sense is address the FOC membership to the missions that are there at a place and ask them to, to act in the spirit of the FOC and, uh, and connect with their colleagues. So this is something that we could uh, work together as well to, to act in the region from both capital and the, and the multi-stakeholder community that is there. Um, with regard to, to uh, the questions on exporting, control, uh, um, exporting um, technologies and holding ourselves to account, I would like to also connect it to the, to the question about, what, uh, about the private sector and the human rights impact assessments, um, because it's, it's, now, it's beautifully linked. Um, in the first place, we committed ourselves to, to taking ourselves taking um, into account the domestic challenges to the foreign policy agenda because it has to be clear the Freedom Online Coalition has a foreign policy agenda towards it's it's clearly directed to changing the rest of the world. But of course, we can't be naive because our own domestic uh, um, developments have an impact on foreign policy. But I can admit this is this is part of my daily business to talk with colleagues in government and talk about the coherence between international and domestic policy. So it's on the agenda definitely. It's definitely on the agenda of the FOC and you already mentioned the per learning session that we're organizing on day zero of the FOC conferences. It's, it's really focused on having this internal discussion with each other to address the challenges and learn from each other because that's, that's what the FOC can really add value. Um, and the linkage with the private sector, it's especially with the um, um, uh, uh, the export of technologies, if you look at the, the, the whole regime of export control that we have, one of the, one of the, the practices that we introduce for ourselves is to have human rights impact assessments for, for the companies that are exporting technologies. And I, I really believe these human rights impact assessments are quite time consuming, but they can be very effective and, and nice instruments to address human rights challenges. For example, in ICANN, but also our SIDN, the Dutch uh, registry, um, embarked on this process of going through a new human rights impact assessment. And thanks for the suggest suggestion to put this uh, higher on the agenda on the FOC. Thank you. Um, I should also mention that the, after some discussion, the coalition has now agreed an internal review mechanism uh, to look at the record of members of the coalition if it does veer considerably away from the core values of the coalition. So that, that process, which I think the civil society groups have been talking about for some time, needing to be put in place, has now been put in place. And so we can, you know, governments can change. You can have a democratic government succeeded by a very undemocratic government. 
and obviously in those circumstances there might be a case for the coalition to re-examine the record of its own members and we, that we now can do that. That's now process in place. But finally, Wolfram, do you want to finally sum up? Yeah, I have uh, the privilege to be very short because my colleagues already mentioned the main points and I don't want to reiterate most of it. Yes, the character of the Freedom Online Coalition is one of a discussion forum, of a forum basically where you can exchange ideas, where you can come to common solutions. And that means for rating countries, for basically intervening, we have other formats. We do it bilaterally, we do it uh, multilaterally, we do it in organizations like the EU, of course. And of course, the discussions we have within the Freedom Online Network will influence our beha the behavior of member states in all these organizations. So indirectly, it has an impact, but not directly. But that means also that uh, that brings me back to the point we discussed a little bit earlier, these faked NGO ex as NGOs as an example of, of an emerging problem. I think it's a common responsibility basically to sort out those elements and that can be only done if we have forum where we discuss that and then I think the more transparency we have over these issues the more transparent who's a real NGO who's basically just a hidden government organizations so it's a hygienic issue and this is best done in, in a transparent and open way and you have a forum for that with the Freedom Online Coalition on the engagement of the private sector, I think honestly that we can do better there. I mean, we started with the advisory network and it's focused on, on NGOs, I would say. We have some connections to private sector, but I think that's worth looking more into it because I think it becomes more and more clear, it's a very dynamic environment, that the private companies have a decisive role in Freedom Online. And I think I leave it with that. Thank you. Well, uh, f thanks to the panel for, for the discussion and thanks to the audience for the contributions you made. If you're interested in the work of the coalition, like to find out more, like to figure out how you can get involved, then you can contact the support unit. My colleague Aisha here uh, works extensively on the FOC issues. Any one of us, my colleague Charles, we're all available. You can speak to us about the coalition and how you might engage. Apart from that, can I thank you for attending and can you show your appreciation to the panelists in the traditional panel? Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference, guys.